Uh, well, thank you. Uh, it's great to see so many people here today uh, at the event. Um, I have a lot to present and a limited amount of time to do it, so uh, to overcome this, I'm going to do this in a very speedy way. Uh, so I apologise in advance for the speed of the delivery. I'm going to talk about uh, the issue of excess mortality, which I'll define as we go along, and I'm doing so in reference, as the other speakers are, to uh, the early, first years of the centre. I realise this looks a bit like a, the start of an epitaph, um, so I should clarify that I'll be looking forward as well as backwards. And in doing so, I'm going to try and tell a story. And the story with regard to this topic of excess mortality is uh, what we knew then at the start of the centre, including what was assumed, what we did, what we know now, and uh, what we still need to know, with the answer to all these things being uh, a lot. So obviously we knew a lot back in 2003, but we've also done a lot, we've also learned a lot, uh, and that's why we're looking so much more bolder and greyer, especially the ladies. Thank you. <laughs> so... <laughs> In terms of what we knew then, uh, well, this whole story of poor health uh, in Scotland in a European context was known then as it is now. But I mention it because in 2003, when the centre was set up, uh, some of the evidence for this came from a report by David Leon and colleagues at the London School of Tropical Hygiene and Medicine, which, uh, among other things, highlighted the fact that poor health in Scotland compared to elsewhere in Europe was driven to a large degree by the slower rate of improvement in comparison with other countries. So every other Western European country has seen its, its health, its life expectancy improve at a faster rate in recent decades. And this is a theme I'm going to come back to at a number of points during the presentation. We also knew that, of course, this overall high levels of Scottish mortality was particularly driven by high rates uh, in Glasgow and the surrounding region of West Central Scotland. And this fact was driving uh, the wide uh, geographical inequalities in mortality within the region, within Scotland and indeed within the UK. And this was confirmed by some of the early work we did for the centre. Uh, Bruce has already shown you uh, Let Glasgow Flourish. I'm just going to mention it one more time to again highlight this issue of slower rate of improvement of health, this time for Glasgow in pink compared to Scotland in blue. In terms of what we thought we knew, well, in trying to understand poor health in Scotland, people have always looked to where mortality is highest. And as I've already said, that is in this West Central Scotland region uh, with Glasgow at the core. Um, and this is also an area, of course, of relatively very high deprivation and uncoincidentally an area that was previously very industrial, but which has since suffered the, uh, profoundly from the effects of deindustrialisation. And I mention these two things because the traditional explanation for poor health in Scotland is always focused focused on deprivation and the underlying causes of post-industrial decline. And all the work we've done in the centre have confirmed that these are fantastically important explanations. And yet there are some complications. One complication came from a piece of work uh, prior to the establishment of GCPH by the uh, much-missed Scottish Council Foundation. And this uh, suggested that the high rates of mortality seen in Scotland were somewhat out of kilter with what some of the economic indicators would uh, predict, especially in, um, in, in comparison with other parts of the UK. And they suggested whether other things were going on and, and uh, coined the, the expression of the Scottish effect. And this uh, so-called effect was quantified then by work led by Phil Hanlon, um, who showed that even after adjustment for differences in economic factors, area-based deprivation, mortality in Scotland was still significantly higher than in other parts of Great Britain. So all cause deaths were about 8% higher, but causes such as stroke and suicide were between 30 and 40% higher than uh, England and Wales after adjustment for differences in poverty. However, coming back to the David Leon report that I mentioned, he also suggested that perhaps some of these national comparisons were problematic, given A, the size of Scotland, and B, the extent to which it had been affected by issues around uh, deindustrialisation and deprivation. And he suggested that perhaps more meaningful and perhaps more favourable comparisons could be made with the post-industrial parts of Scotland with other places in Europe that had gone through a similar process and to a similar degree. And this is what we did. And what we did was uh, to destroy many trees by creating many, many reports. And to summarise briefly what two phases of work did, in the first, we quantified this uh, level of deindustrialisation experience in West Central Scotland, and then on that basis uh, sought and found other regions across Europe that had undergone a similar process to the same degree, and then undertook very detailed analysis of mortality uh, over a number of years uh, across all these different regions. The second phase was equally data-driven, but this time focusing not on mortality data, but on data on the broader health determinants. 
And this was uh, carried out alongside other important work to look at economic, political and historical factors which provide an important context for the comparison of such trends. So I won't go into this in detail, but in terms of quantifying this uh, level of deindustrialisation, we showed there have been uh, huge decreases in levels of industrial employment within West Central Scotland in recent decades. But importantly, similar processes had occurred elsewhere. Uh, within uh, both the UK and also in Eastern and Western mainland Europe. So, for example, in Merseyside, and I'll come back to Liverpool in just a few minutes, uh, where there was a similar, indeed identical, uh, lo uh, proportional loss of industrial employment. In parts of northern France, which had uh, large mining areas, but which have since lost all their mines, all the industry has disappeared. In lovely parts of West Ger the former West Germany, such as the Ruhr area, also affected massively by deindustrialisation. Uh, former parts of the of the former East Germany, which have gone through again similar difficult processes, and indeed, for example, in parts of Poland. So it was thought that in making more like for like uh, comparisons with the equivalents of of West Central Scotland, if you like, in their own areas, we might see uh, the, the 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 health comparisons appear uh, more favourably. But that was not the case. And across, looking at across all these regions, only two had lower life expectancy with regard to males. Uh, and these two regions were about to overtake us, given, again, their faster rate of improvement compared to West Central Scotland. And indeed, for female life expectancy, this had already occurred. So even in comparison with these similar deindustrialized, deprived regions, uh, health in West Central Scotland was absolutely bottom of the heap. A number of other important findings emerged from this work. First, it confirmed deindustrialisation as a, a hugely important factor. All these regions have poor health relative to their parent countries. So West Central Scotland is not alone in this regard. But it also cast doubt on whether deindustrialisation was a sufficient explanation to properly explain the poor, particular poor health profile of West Central Scotland and what was going on in the region. However, it also enabled much greater understanding of the differences between post-industrial regions in the UK uh, compared to those on mainland Europe. Uh, with, with, for example, I don't have time to go into details here, with the UK areas uh, characterised by having wider income inequalities compared to places in, uh, on mainland Europe. Here's one quick example of the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of income inequality and in showing that those regions uh, with the higher, higher levels of income inequalities were within the UK. And these wider income inequalities were clearly driving wider health inequalities. And we showed that uh, geographical inequalities in mortality were wider in West Central Scotland than in any other deindustrialised region of Europe. And we also identified important differences in the economic, political and historical context in these regions. So, for example, that some regions received better protection from their national governments in the face of deindustrialisation compared to West Central Scotland. Uh, that in some of them the policy response to deindustrialisation was, was better. Uh, and of course that the UK areas were subject to um, different, uh, more right-wing neoliberal economic policies which created uh, wider income inequalities. But what it didn't do was clarify why some of these other UK regions which had been subject to these same uh, UK economic policies and which had also experienced deindustrialisation and been affected by similar levels of deprivation had better health in West Central Scotland. So at that point what we did was then focus more specifically on these UK areas and uh, particularly looking at deprivation as a driver of poor health. What we did was again produce reports. And within these reports and papers, we under described the uh, undertaking of detailed analysis of deprivation and mortality in Glasgow compared to its most similar cities in the UK, and principally Liverpool and Manchester, though we also did work for Belfast that I won't get into today. Many of you will have seen these slides, uh, so I'll rattle through them even uh, more quickly than I'm doing already. Uh, but what the work showed was that at the time we did the work, that levels of deprivation in Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester were A, extraordinarily high, uh, but B, very, very similar. And indeed, if we, we dig below the city level to very small areas in each city of about 1,500 people, we can show the, enor the, the enormous uh, range in levels of deprivation experienced in each area. So areas with very, very few people, uh, classes deprived in these terms in Glasgow to areas with in excess of 60% of the population. But the real point is to show how this compares with places like Liverpool, where it's exactly the same, and Manchester, 
where it's very, very similar. So given that everything we know about the links between deprivation and poverty on the one hand and mortality on the other, you would therefore expect very similar mortality profiles across the three cities. But as I'm sure many of you know, that's not what we saw. Uh, with premature deaths in Glasgow being a whopping 30% higher than in Liverpool and Man Manchester, even after adjustment for any remaining differences in deprivation. And this excess was even greater among the younger working age population, 15 to 44, and deaths uh, uh, at all ages were 15% higher in Glasgow than the two English cities, equating to many thousands of earlier deaths in the city, even in comparison to these two similarly deprived cities. Two other findings I'll mention very quickly. The first is that this excess was also seen across all neighbourhood types, from comparisons of the least deprived areas across the cities to comparisons of the most deprived uh, areas of the cities. This is for deaths at all ages. However, one difference was that for premature deaths, the excess was higher in comparisons of the more deprived rather than the less deprived areas. So suggesting that there are either two different phenomena going on or a more concentrated version of the phenomenon which is particularly affecting people in Glasgow in the, po in the poorer parts of the city compared to people living in equally poor parts of Liverpool and Manchester. And finally, coming back to this theme of a slower rate of improvement in Glasgow, uh, we again see this in terms of long-term trends in premature deaths, where although premature mortality improved in Glasgow, it improved much faster in Liverpool, with a clear widening gap between the cities uh, since the uh, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, a similar uh, pattern for in comparison to Manchester, uh, though not quite such a, a striking gap. So to summarise all this then, in terms of what we know now about these three cities, uh, we know that they have uh, remarkably similar deprivation profiles but remarkably different mortality profiles. And this excess, as I just said, is seen across all sections of the population in Glasgow. It's not explained uh, from what we can see by historical changes in deprivation nor by the makeup of the different uh, populations, for example, the age profile or the ethnic profile. And the reason to mention this again is just to, to, to build up to the point that, that when you start looking at lots and lots of data for these cities, uh, you see that, that all three of them, but particularly Glasgow and, and Liverpool, uh, have remarkable similarities, remarkably similar in, in terms of economic indicators of absolute poverty, relative poverty, child poverty, income inequalities, uh, indicators of the social environment, educational attainment, lone parent households, teenage pregnancies. All things are, are very, very similar except for mortality. And what's driving this excess is something we don't quite know, uh, but it doesn't prevent people from uh, guessing what they think it might be. And all sorts of potential hypotheses have been put forward. I'm not going to read all these out. Uh, and this creates another difficulty for us in terms of trying to bring some order to this, uh, this mess, if you like. And to do that, what we did uh, was, again, produce another report, another paper, which, in work led by Jerry McCartney, who's now at NHS Health Scotland, uh, he or we summarised and assessed all these many different theories that had been suggested in terms of how plausible, or in some cases, implausible they were. And what Jerry did was to categorise them in terms of artifact, artifactual hypotheses. For example, that it is about deprivation, but we are not measuring or capturing it properly. And he grouped the, 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 the other ones in terms of uh, what he called upstream uh, hypotheses, including the effects of national and government policy, for example. He, in terms of midstream explanations, I won't read all these out, and in terms of downstream explanations. And he also uh, mentioned the uh, suggestion of a genetics component. Now, on the one hand, this is obviously uh, a ludicrous because it's not as if there's going to be one uh, single one of these candidate explanations which will provide the answer. And in trying to get your head around the, the, the various issues here in terms of how uh, complex and interacting all these different factors would be and the other things that aren't mentioned here, uh, the probably a, a better representation of the slide would be this. Uh, but on the other hand, it is useful to have this as some kind of framework to systematically look at whether we can identify any differences between the cities. And so we're using this as a, the basis of a programme of research to look at Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester for whether any such differences seem to exist. I'm going to finish just shortly, but I'll just give you a couple of examples of the research to date. So, for example, people have hypothesised that there may be differences in a uh, so-called psychological outlook in Glasgow compared to Liverpool and Manchester, so that optimism may be lower, uh, less hope for the future, and this would impact on behavioural choices. 
People have hypothesised this uh, safely because there were no data by which it could be supported or refuted. Uh, but we've now collected data from a, a decent sized and decently representative sample of the three cities and that shows using a well-known measure of optimism that uh, optimism seems uh, very similar in Glasgow and Liverpool and uh, actually higher than in Manchester. So this seems now a less plausible explanation. People have also hypothesised that there may be differences in the sense of coherence, uh, the extent to which people are resilient to the negative effects of stress on their health and well-being. And and again, from the survey data, we can show that that seems maybe less plausible, uh, given that sense of coherence from these data suggests it is actually higher in Glasgow than the two English cities. People have also hypothesised that there may be differences in social capital, given the evidence from the literature of the links between social capital and mortality. And indeed, we have identified a couple of differences in uh, aspects of social capital, reciprocity and here on this chart uh, trust being lower in Glasgow from these data that we've collected and in terms of social participation with rates of volunteering, a classically used indicator of social capital being lower in Glasgow than the two uh, English cities. People have also hypothesised that it might be about early years experiences given what we know about the links between those and adult health outcomes. Um, but we've got some uh, a report coming out uh, very, very soon uh, in which we show using quite sophisticated measures of uh, parenting and early years uh, experiences that actually they're very, very similar uh, in the three cities. And perhaps that's not a surprise given the similar socioeconomic profiles of the three places. I won't go on any further, but all these um, explanations in blue or potential theories in blue uh, are ones that we are either have been looking at or are looking at or will be looking at. And as I say, they, they form a part of this programme of research. And what I'll finish off by saying is that uh, it's important to remember that seeking an understanding of this excess isn't an excuse to ignore the non-excess. So this final chart shows uh, a measure of poverty on the x-axis and, um, and male life expectancy in the way, on the y-axis, making the obvious point uh, that poverty is a huge driver of mortality in any city. And if we just highlight where Glasgow is, you see there that it's an outlier and this gap from where you think it might be in terms of these data is this excess mortality and it equates, as I've said, to many thousands of premature deaths and therefore it's paramount that we understand what's going on. But at the same time, uh, we can't ignore the reality that poverty drives poor health in any cities within the UK and we shouldn't look at the results of the, the uh, investigations into excess mortality without still concentrating on the need to address poverty and deprivation. And finally, uh, I was asked to include a final slide around the fact there's been a lot of media speculation about all this, uh, and this kicked off again uh, towards the end of last year when there was an article in The Guardian um, discussing uh, Glasgow's health, and this resulted in many journalists getting in touch from all, all, all sorts of places, from the south of England, from France, and uh, from Norway. And the journalist from Norway was particularly insistent that uh, the cause of this excess related to diet and in particular the deep fried Mars bar and to cut a long story short um, she eventually promised not to write about the deep fried Mars bar but in the final um, publication of her work in a, in a two-page spread in the uh, Norwegian National Press uh, she produced uh, one page which asked the question of why people in Scotland die younger than people in England and on the right hand page gave what uh, a handy hint to, sh to what she thought it might be in terms of a, a three-step guide to creating a deep-fried Mars bar uh, and I think I'll leave it at that.